really focus around sites near Bloomsburg University. And I know it sounds funny, but as a marine ecologist, I actually ended up studying uh, birds and behavior and stuff. So making relief to tree swallows wasn't that hard. Um, but this whole project that I'm going to talk to you about, feathers and thermal, re uh, thermal regulatory, started off based on the, the projects that were funded by PSO by looking at tree swallow reproduction. All right, how many babies they have in relation to their prey availability. So, all right, we got, you know, insects and stuff like that. And we're looking at their insects and then we're looking at, uh, you know, how many babies they're having and all that stuff. And at the same time, just like Mercy, we have nest boxes, which I'm going to show you in just a second. And I've been checking their nest boxes and then I really started to take a good look at their nests. And that led me to some of the questions that I'm going to have here. Oh, how are we doing? All right. I just want to get the... Sure. That thing off. You know, do the hide the floating meeting controls. I can't see what it says then. Oh. All right, go down, scroll down, 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 one button, stop. That one? No, no, down. Is that good? Oh, that's all. Awesome. Shut up. All right, we're good. <laughs> so this project that I'm going to talk to you about really started off because we kept checking these boxes and I was looking at their nests and stuff. So let's see, does this work? You have to click back on the slide. To see oh, I have to click back on it? Let's see. There's always these technical things. Click in the middle anywhere else. Anywhere on the slide, like oh, no here. Is this gonna work? Oh, help! I'm not because I'm on the actual. I need to be on Zoom. Oh. oh, huzzah! All right, here we go. All right, always the minor technical issues. All right, so I'm gonna talk to you about tree swallows, and uh, so they're small migratory songbirds. You guys probably know them, right? So they tend to overwinter, say, in places like Florida and Central America, South America, stuff like that. Right around in March, they come up. And um, and then they start making their, their nests and stuff like that. They are just like kestrels. They, uh, they build their nests in natural cavities, so holes in trees and stuff like that. Right? That's how it would normally look. But just like Mercy talked about, they actually recruit really, really well to nest boxes. And so they make, it makes them really, really easy to study. In fact, tree swallows are among the highest studied songbirds in the world, not only because they recruit so well to nest boxes, but also because they're very, very tolerant of human presence. So we can check their nests, we can handle their fledglings, we can do all sorts of stuff. And if you have the right permits, you can handle the adults and stuff like that. And they don't abandon their nests, they don't abandon their fledglings. And so it makes them super easy and fun to study. So one of the things, as I mentioned, I kept opening up all these nest boxes and what you'll see, and this is a hallmark of a lot of tree swallow nests is that they put feathers in their nests. So when they start building their nest, they grab grass, they start to build it in, they start to grab some feathers and intercalate it all in there. And then they start to build these feather cups, right? And I was like, oh, that's interesting, right? But here's what struck me. You see that? This one, let's see, is there a pointer on this? Oh yeah, there's a pointer. That particular nest had like, what, two feathers? And that one up there has like, oh, I don't know, a hundred? So, and it's at the same site, right? And so I'll tell you a little bit more about the sites in just a second. So it struck me that there's this big discrepancy between like three feathers and like 193 feathers. So I started asking like, okay, well, how many feathers are they sticking in their nests? And I started asking all these questions and I was really surprised that the literature is a bit thin. We don't know a lot about this, right? Which is really, really surprising because, you know, if you're that tree swallow, right? So they, they, they nest in pairs and stuff like that. Putting three feathers in your nest, not a big deal, right? They're about this big, they fly, they pick them up. But can you imagine that bird, 193 feathers? That's a lot of energy to spend. Why are they doing this? I don't know, I don't know. And so that's kind of what I'm gonna to try to find out. So, so I started looking in the literature. Well, how many feathers? <laughs> well, paper came out, this paper was uh, out in I think in Ohio and stuff, about an average of 77 feathers. Okay, there's something in there. All right, we got another one. Oh, an average of 138 feathers. Okay, there's a little bit here. Right, uh, we get, Dave Wiggles did a ton of work. Okay, maybe an average of five, there's a zero to 70. Okay, so some papers are kind of living. But again, it's not clear whether there's any patterns. There's no rhyme or reason to this. It's just not clear in the literature. So I, this is the whole basis of a lot of what I'm gonna try to show you. Okay. The other thing that struck me was that there's almost no information about the size of the feathers that they use. Okay, so again, 
This paper, like I said, I just mentioned, what she found out was about 63% of the feathers they stuck in there were in the five to 10 centimeter size block. But that's it. That's the only paper I've ever really found that talks about what size of feathers. And you're like, well, what does that matter? But you think about like a bird, it's like this, this big, right? Picking up a feather that's what, two centimeters, that's not a big deal. But some of the feathers I find in my box are like, you know, eight, nine centimeters long. And so I'm curious to see, is that regular? Is there a purpose to this? I don't know. All right, so again, you see those, those are big flight feathers. But again, there's just not that much known. Why do they add the feathers? Actually, I'm gonna ask the audience, why do you think they add feathers? Because I need to know. <laughs> I'm really dying, why do you think? They like chicken feathers, good. Why else would they spend all this time and energy putting feathers in their nests? Any other thoughts? Say it again. Insulation, yeah, maybe, yeah. I mean, those are good ideas. I have no idea. Sorry, I keep bumping this. So why did, maybe. Actually, there was there's some interesting ideas that maybe that there's like a, a sexual selection component to it. Uh, anecdotally, when I go out in March and I'm checking my boxes, I'll notice that a lot of the empty boxes will have like a single feather in there. And I'm like, are they marking the boxes? There was another, there's a dissertation where they noticed where like, if you blow feathers into the air, the adults will like catch them and drop them and they do these aerial acrobatics. I don't know, maybe they're playing. I have no idea, right? So maybe there's some of that. Um, there are actually some good papers where they added some feathers or they took them away and there's faster chick growth. They didn't speculate why that is, right? Um, maybe there's, they, they fledge a little faster. Maybe they have fewer parasites. Okay, those are all really good theories, right? And again, a lot of papers are sort of zeroing around the idea that there's some thermal regulation. Basically, they're buffering. Are they making it warmer? Are they cooling things off? So that's kind of where I'm leaning. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that now. But so here's a little bit what we know. We know there's some papers that say, hey, if that nest box gets above 35 degrees, you start to have mortality. So again, some of the literature is saying, well, maybe actually the feathers keep things cooler, right? Um, actually, this is one good, like, so this Windsor et al. paper said that if you have the feathers, actually it cools the nest boxes a little bit slower. That's good. You want to avoid being too cold, especially young chicks. You don't want them to be too cold, right? And, but here's what's interesting is that inside the nest cups themselves, because they, they build those little cups, right? That it's actually two to seven degrees warmer. So maybe they're, they're keeping them warm in some ways. Maybe they're slowing cooling, maybe not. And so Again, there's a lot of unanswered questions that my research is gonna to try to start to tackle. So here's, a, I'm gonna go through a series of hypotheses that I postulated, and we're gonna go through together how many of them I got right and how many of them I got wrong. But it led to some really fun questions, right? So hypothesis one, sites with similar, similar sites should have similar numbers of feathers. That makes sense, right? So here's my second hypothesis is that there should be some function to this. So I had this idea that if you had more feathers, you would have greater reproductive success, right? I mean, they're putting those feathers in for a reason. They should actually be doing better. So a second hypothesis, right? More feathers, better reproductive success. I thought that as they're going around, I thought that there would be variation because you know, I think this site, oh, this has this kind of feathers, this site has this kind of feathers, that there would be site to site variation in feather sizes. Mm -hmm. You guys can see how many of these I got wrong. Here's another one. This one's going to get a little, this, this uh, is the idea here is that I was thinking that the feathers or that the nest would keep the nest boxes at a certain temperature because the literature says that the chicks really like to be between 28 and 38 degrees, 26 and 38 degrees centigrade. That's the sort of optimal incubation temperature, right? So I'm thinking, oh, they put all these feathers in and those nest boxes should stay right around that, right? That's what I thought. I love this because this is one of my sites and it just so happened that that particular nest box we constructed ended up with a little bit of a hole and I came back and there was this giant flight feather stuck in the hole and I wasn't sure if the adults were trying to block a draft or if they were afraid their chicks would fall into the hole but either one I thought that was kind of funny so they'll actually block it they don't just like put the feathers in their nests and stuff but all right so how are we doing all this so I'm going to I'm going to focus today on the sites that are actually near Bloomsburg University. Remember, I really wanted to have a student focused research program. So I have undergrads and graduate students on my research. So all of these sites I'm going to talk about are all within like 20 kilometers of, of Bloomsburg. 
And we have FY, TR, GE, and LT. These are named after the property owners. So Fry, Tanner, Geis, and Lowris. We actually partner with property owners. We put these nest boxes out on their properties and they allow us uh, the liberty to come and check on them. So I'm very grateful for them. And at the end of the reproductive season, what we do is we go and collect nests. Uh, see, I need field help, so that's my son on the left. He has to come out and help me, right? And so at the end of the reproductive season, we actually collect the nests, sort, we bring them back into the lab and we sort and count all these feathers, right? I don't do that. My, my undergrads do this. This is how this is a student supported project, right? So and I, actually have, I actually have two graduate students who are gonna be working on this as well too. So they sort and count all the feathers. And the other thing that we started doing again to get at like what size, again, are they using big feathers, little feathers, what are they doing? What they actually can do is uh, we can use image J. We can use image J to trace. They actually can trace the feathers and get pretty accurate sizes. So getting sizes, so we're collecting the nests, we're counting the feathers, we're, we're getting the sizes, right? Out in the field, we're counting chicks and fledglings, right? Oh, babies, right? Oh, so cute. We count how many, you know, how many eggs there are, how many chicks hatch, how many fledglings there are, that kind of stuff to get in metrics of reproductive success. This is the fun part. This is the best part of my job, going out there. And then in last year, I, I started putting these thermal logger, temperature sensors, right? So I use these elite tech ones. I'll show you what they are. Uh, they're, they're elite tech thermal loggers, and they're actually used uh, for food safety. But what we do is that we put them on the outside of the box to connect ambient temperatures. I actually stuck uh, the, the temperature sensors next to the nests, and then I stuck um, one on the, up, on the upper inside of the box. These particular models are too big to stick inside the nest cups. Those I button ones are really great, but they're much more expensive. And so that'll be the next leg in my journey. So if you guys have ever seen those, those go inside the nest cups. I just need them, but this is how the setup. So I don't know if you guys are gonna, how you guys are gonna feel about how, how well I did with my hypotheses, but all right. So here's the first one. I'm gonna walk you through a few years of data. This couple, the 2020, it was the first year I collected these nests. Here's the site, one, two, and three. There's actually no significant differences in the feather number across the sites, okay? So that was pretty good. And I had an average up there of 56 feathers per nest. That's a lot, right? That's, not, that's a lot of energy. You see there's a bit of a range. So, okay, I'm doing good so far. All right, so same thing. We have these different sites, Fry, Lowris, and Tanner, feather number. Again, no significant differences. Pretty good. This is interesting. The next year, the feather number went up, 66 feathers per nest. Huh? Preliminary data from last year. Again, we added a site. Again, here's the sites and here's feather number. All right, not too bad. Again, no significant differences. You can see there's some variation, but there's no, and the feather numbers are going up. I'm actually curious now looking at this data. I don't know if they're now adding more feathers per, per year. We're gonna have to track that over time. So all right, I did pretty good, all right? Feather, so the sites that are similar. So just remember, these are all sites that are all wetlands, they're all near Bloomsburg, they're all very similar. And I'm gonna lead you to that at the end when I talk about how I'm broadening out this project, okay? This is what surprised me, because I was like, okay, why are they doing this? Is there any relationship to feather number and reproductive success? <clears throat> uh, yeah, no. So here's feather number, everything from like what, three feathers up to, you know, 100 and something, 119 feathers. And what this is showing is the number of hatched chicks the number of fledged chicks, the percent of fledge. I thought there would be like some linear thing, maybe it would taper off. I expected something like this. No, there's no relationship to reproductive success, none. Not in 2021 either. So they're spending a lot of time and energy putting these feathers into the boxes, into these nests, and there's no real benefit to this. And I, I'm working on the 2022 data set, so I didn't have that for you yet, right? So there's no relationship. And so I was going, well, that's weird. Why are they doing this? And one thing that I actually think is happening is that nest boxes are an amazing tool for ecologists, but they're artificial, right? And it's sort of like saying what I really need to be looking at are natural nests, right? To get up in those nest cavities and look at those feather numbers. I don't know how to do that. Does, if anybody here can help me access natural nests, I would love to talk to you, but I don't know how to climb those trees and get to them. So it's a little bit like, I was thinking about this. I go, it's a difference between like, hey, I need like five blankets if I'm going to pitch a tent in my yard outside. And I need, you know, I don't really need that. I don't even need a blanket if I'm in my nice house. And with the desk boxes, we're basically creating little bird condos 
maybe they're doing this behavior because that is what they were evolutionary designed to do, but they don't really need to do it. I don't know. It's just a thought. Like maybe it's a carryover of a behavior that they don't really need. So my second hypothesis is not supported. <laughs> All right. All right. So here's another thing I thought for sure, because again, they're flying around. I thought maybe there would be differences in feather size, right? Okay, like this site here, maybe they have more ducks. Maybe they're pulling songbird feathers, whatever. So here's 2020. And again, here's these sites, Fry, Lowers, and Tanner. Here's average feather or these feather area. And there's no significant differences. And it's not, it's the true for 2021 as well, right? So there's no significant differences in feather sizes. So what it's telling me is one of two things. So either, either the, the, the type of birds that they're selecting are the same. Maybe, they're, maybe there's just geese everywhere, right? Maybe it's all ducks. Maybe the feather availability is the same. Or they are selecting certain feather sizes because that's beneficial to them. I don't have an answer for you. I won't know that until I expand my research project is what I'm currently trying to do. So again, I don't know if they're choosing the same kind across all these different sites or it's just feather availability. So hypothesis three, rejected. <laughs> okay, I'm doing so great here. <laughs> so now we're gonna talk a little bit about temperature, okay? So here's what I wanna show you. So here's that thermal logger position, I'll remind you. And this is the ambient, this is on the outside of the box, right underneath the top. So inside, it's inside the box, but at the top and near the bottom. And here's the, the temperature in Celsius, right? And this is different. So what this is telling me is that the inside of the box is definitely warmer than the outside. Good, that's cool, right? And that actually near the bottom, right? Right next to the nest is definitely warmer, actually about three degrees warmer, okay? But that's not what surprised me about this data set, huh? So what this is gonna show you, hold on, is this is just tracking those ambient temperatures. Remember ambient's on the outside, right? right, right, right over, over the time, right? So what this is, what this yellow bar is, hold on, is that, remember, I told you that optimum incubation temperature. The chicks really like to be between 26, 38 degrees. And ambient, okay, makes sense. The outside temperatures are cold, okay? That's just it, it's just saying the outside temperatures are colder. All right, that's fine. But what I thought, my hypothesis was that the nest boxes would stay in that optimum temperature band a lot more often. And they don't. <laughs> they do a little. <laughs> so here's that top temperature, oh, right? So it did shift up a little bit, right? So this is the top of the box. Remember, right at the top. Oh, where did it go? Oh, the bottom temperature, did I overshoot? Hold on. All right, so there we go. All right, here we go, All right? So again, it does shift up. So the top of the box, okay, it's a little bit warmer. Okay, we got a little bit, but again, the inside of that box, that top of the, the box isn't staying within that optimal band very much. And that surprised me. And this also surprised me. Even at the bottom of us, right next to the nest, right? It's still, we're still getting, you know, that, that bottom of the nest is still getting really cold, right? Super, super cold, a lot more cold than I expected. This is what worries me too about 30% of the days in some cases are way above that optimal temperature. In some cases, this, these days are 111 degrees Fahrenheit in those boxes. That worries me, right? I didn't have mass ch chick mortality, but that's hot. And so this has an implication for climate change, right? These boxes may get way too hot and we have to, we may have to think about that. So again, this didn't stay within those optimal temperatures. Now, again, I wanna preface this for anybody who's ever like thought about this. What I really need in order to evaluate these temperatures is I need these little button uh, thermal loggers that go inside the nest cup or like go right underneath it. And that I need, that's the next leg of this. So this is a little artificial. Hypothesis four rejected. <laughs> I have to think about my degree in science here. Um, no, it's fine, <laughs> right. but it's fine, right? So here's my conclusion. Similar habitats had similar feather numbers and similar feather sizes. Actually, that kind of makes sense, right? But again, that was limited. I was talking, I showed you what, three, maybe four sites. They're all similar, you know, wetlands, all near Bloomsburg University. Feather number didn't equal reproductive success, right? But again, that's an artificial, we're talking about nest boxes. And the only way for me to really evaluate this would be to, to, to look at um, like natural nests. 
the nest boxes aren't staying within that optimal temperature as often as I really expected. And I don't know what that means. I don't know if the boxes are getting too cold. I don't know if they're going to get too hot with climate change. I just don't know, right? So I'm expanding. So the only way for me to do this is to do more, more studies, right? So one of the great things is that I've been partnering with a lot of different organizations, a lot of different people to get a lot more nests and stuff. So in 2021, I actually got a uh, nest from Coker Park, which is near Bloomsburg, um, Ricketts Glen, Blue Marsh Lake, which is run by the Army Corps of Engineers, and Mansfield University. I didn't show you that data because we're still processing some of them. In 2022, I actually started partnering with the Cavity Nesting Trails Program run through the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and 11 state parks sent me their nests. I have 100 and no, I've got like 200 nests sitting in my lab needing to be processed just from last year. Okay, so I'm excited. I just need a lot more help, right? I love it. They are so gracious. Now I have 14 state parks and the Game Commission, because I gave a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago, they're going to partner with me. And why am I, why am I, Lori, why are you talking about any of this? Well, here's the thing. Like now what I can do is I can look at these nests. I can look at feather number, feather sizes, reproductive success in wetlands, in riparian areas. So, you know, like streams and stuff. I can look at these differences across habitat types, temperature regimes. I can get a better idea of how these birds are making these choices because now I'm gonna have a lot more sites that cover over 51,000 square kilometers in Pennsylvania. It's a lot and it's super awesome. I'm very excited about this. All right, in the lab. <laughs> so I posed this to my, one of my students. I said, you wanna um, experimentally bake uh, tree swallow nests? Yes, so, bake, so these are abandoned nests, right? So what we've been doing, what we've piloted in, uh, in fall is we experimentally heated up the nests in the lab. Again, no chicks, these are all abandoned. And we put thermal loggers and we're trying to look at how much they heat, how much they cool, stuff like that. So we're doing experiments in the lab to get at are they heating them? Are they cooling them? What are they doing? We actually threw nest boxes in there too to look at the role of the nest box itself. Uh, we need to. We actually need to uh, reconfigure our methods, uh, and so that's why I didn't present that data. But again, still, like we're like, I want to experiment with these things and how many feathers and try all sorts of stuff. So these are experimental designs. <laughs> I'm super excited. I'm going to try this in about a week. Uh, so remember, I told you how there might be a social component to uh, feather use. So I, last year, I got this idea to blow feathers into the air with a fan, just like that, and see what the birds do. And you know what they did? They caught the feathers, they dropped them, they dove for them and stuff like that. There's a behavior component to this that, uh, that I'm going to play with this summer, and I'm trying to recruit a grad student to help me with this. Basically, I was like, so I told my boss or my, my, my department chair, I'm like, I need a fan to blow feathers into the air uh, to watch birds catch them. And she's like, all right, cool. So we yeah, got them. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, this is science, right? Why not play? <laughs> uh, here's a problem. I have never seen this before. Um, what is that? Well, what? Oh, a dryer sheet. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I'm thinking it's not toilet paper. I'll tell you right now, right? The, uh, this is, these are paper towels, right? And I'd never seen this, but this is, this, is, this is a picture I took at one of my sites in Bloomsburg. And actually my grad student, Deanna, is working out at Mount, Mount Pisgah and she got this. So I was like, oh boy, they're picking up bits of, bits of paper and they're putting them in. And I didn't know if they thought they were feathers or something like that, but that's gonna lead to some other questions that I have. Like, are there, what are their search images? How are they looking for things and stuff like that? So there's gonna be a lot more questions about this. And actually I'm trying to convince one of my undergrads to stay and do a master's project so that we can look at this and look at different feather, or I'm sorry, like paper sizes and colors. How are they selecting these things, right? So it was an op it was uh, opportunistic. This was a problem. You guys can't see this too well. You see it right in here. You guys see what it is? What is it? It could, yeah, it's plastic. So plastics in the nest. And so this is a problem. And I was going to ask you about microplastics. Um, I know that other people are looking at microplastics and stuff inside the birds and stuff, right? So this is a problem. I pull this. By the way, anytime I find trash or or even paper, I pull them out. But we're making note of these. Things. So I don't, I don't leave them in there. But if they are lighting their, their, uh, their nests with plastic, that's going to change how they heat up, how they cool down, you know, exposure to toxins and plastics. This is going to be a big problem, right? So here's some of my bigger, my big picture questions. With these collaborations I have with all these different partners, 
I want to know if regional uh, if there are any regional differences in feather use, and what does that tell us about the tree swallows' adapt uh, adaptability to climate change? Cooler areas, are they using more feathers, fewer feathers, this and that? What is that going to tell us? Because climate change is coming, and we need to know how these birds are responding to it, right? Uh, you know, are they going to adjust their their feather linings? I don't know. Are they going to be able to sense those changes and make make the changes to their feather linings over time? I, I'm really, because I'm really an ecologist, I want to know how these nests are regulating temperature if they are. So that's some of the experiments in the field and in the lab. What is their function? Is it more feathers? Is it the grass? What is happening? So that's kind of what I'm leaning into. The other thing, again, I didn't talk about is how the nest boxes themselves. You know, we may have to think about redesigns to our nest boxes with, temp with climate change if they're getting too hot, or I guess, I mean, potentially too cold. And so I'm going to be experimenting with different designs and different things to look at nest boxes themselves. The social component, yeah, I'm going to go blow feathers into the air. And I'm, we're, gonna, we're actually, we're, we're joking around, like, well, will they pick up bright pink feathers? And I don't know. Like, so we're going to, I don't know, play with some more. Right. And then what can we learn about from the trash? Again, the plastics, the different pieces of paper, stuff like that. What does that tell us about their selection, but then also about what's happening in their environment? And then I have a lot of acknowledgements, but I kind of run fast, so I know I got to see them. So again, the property owners and my different partners and stuff, I'll pop through this. Oops, I went too far. Of course I did. All right, and I will take some questions. Thank you so much for being a patient audience. Yeah. Do you know whether it's the male or the female that's setting feathers? It's as far as I know, it's both. Yeah, they're both because they actually both contribute to parental care. I don't know who's dropping the feathers as like the calling card in the nest box. That may be the males because I know that there is some sexual selection there, but I think they're both adding them because I've seen I've seen females with uh, feathers in their mouth. Yeah. What else? What you got? Okay. Oh. So actually, it's really great that you asked that. So the question was, you know, our feather number, is it a learned behavior? And actually, as, as a behavioral ecologist, I would love to know the answer to that. The best way to do that is for me to band the birds, but I don't have my master banders license. So I would need to partner with somebody to look and see like, oh, you know, this parent used, they were that random one that put 193 feathers, but like, oh, this one, their parent used five. I would love to do that. I just need a banders license to be able to follow them through. And I don't have that yet. Yeah, fair enough. What else? Yeah, in the back. When the feathers came, uh, over the years, when were you oh, great. So the question is, when, when are the feathers placed into the nest? So it's all during nest building, right before uh, they lay their eggs. So they start to, we start to see they're building their nests, and then we start to see them intercalating, putting those feathers in, and then right before they lay their eggs, they'll create that cup. Right. So right before, after that, I think they don't touch them. I don't think that they deal with the net. I don't think they deal with the feathers. Yeah. Um, so have you looked at the feather, uh, different colors or different species, all of that? Is there been any? Yeah. So the question is whether there are different colors that they're using in different species. I brought, I actually wanted to add that as a line item. Yeah. So that's another leg of our of our research. Anecdotally, my the birds at our sites use mostly white feathers, right? But the sites, so Merritt Wolf they found mostly gray feathers. And I don't know if it's availability or they're specifically selecting for certain colors. Um, that's a good question. And then the types of birds, again, it's really hard to, to, to ID birds based on their feathers. The best way to do that is with DNA analysis. And so that would be another leg of it. But I'm just anecdotally, they're mostly picking up goose feathers because I think that's what's there. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Do you have to know, have you ever seen it with any other swallow species where they make the same thing as goose feathers in the as far as I know, they don't. So like barn swallows don't do it and stuff. I know that house sparrows will use feathers and that bluebirds, and once in a while we'll get a bluebird in our box, they'll put like one in there. Um, but the only other species that uses feather cups that I have seen, and again, some of you may have greater experience than I do, um, are the wrens, right? So I've seen they build their stick nests and then they'll put that feather cup. The only thing is that when I was trying to work, um, I was working with the state parks, I'm like, oh, let's collect wren nests. The problem is that apparently as soon as the chicks fledge, the parents remove the feathers. So you have to time it just right. Apparently they don't want like predators to find them. So collecting wren nests with feathers is really, really tough, apparently. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. 
it, it tracked again the inside temperatures were you know about a degree to three degrees warmer so that's nice like i said the only thing that surprised me is i really just thought that nest box condo would just keep everything nice and cozy and it didn't not as much as i thought yeah it's about a one to three degrees warmer yeah have you allowed or set up an experiment where uh, those could select a preference for certain kind of feathers so you can see uh, what they can choose so the question is, you know, whether we've ever set up an experiment to, to allow the birds to choose. I didn't, but my colleague, Dr. Leslie Clifford at Mansfield University, she did a pilot study like this. Oh, she said about 10 years ago. And it was interesting to see. So I desperately want to re replicate that study um, and then add like the paper or like bright, like I said, bright orange feathers or something like that. That's what I'm trying to recruit. I have an undergrad I like a lot and I'm trying to convince her to stay and do a master's with me to do something like that. Yeah. But I know that, that Dr. Clifford did a choice experiment. 